John Sansom, and I'm substituting for Carl Drummond, who is the uh, Dean of Arts and Sciences, who is out of town right now. It is my privilege to uh, introduce our sixth featured faculty speaker, Rick Sutter, who is a professor of anthropology and uh, chair of the Department of Anthropology here at IPFW. Uh, the title of his talk today is The Moche Sacrificial Victims, Their Origins and Implications. It's uh, always a thrill for me to be able to share uh, my, my research with people. I never get tired of talking about this particular topic. Um, I've probably given the talk uh, at least 10 to 15 times, but it just never gets tired for me. Um, and I, I'm, I'm very honored to have been selected as one of the featured faculty researchers. Um, we've got a really a, a, a wonderful uh, faculty at IPFW that uh, are all doing really great, wonderful, and exciting research. And uh, so, anyways, I'd like to thank Louise and uh, other folks who've been helping to organize these events. Um, it, it really is a, a thrill for me to be able to present this. In any case, um, this research I'm going to be talking about is part of my broader research on the peopling of, of the Andes, the prehistoric peopling of the Andes. and. Uh, so with the, the database I've been collecting over the past 15 years or so, um, I've also been able to amass data from specific regions that have allowed me to test and look at specific questions uh, to each region within the Andes. And so this is just one of the more exciting uh, topics I've been able to explore through my research. For those of you uh, unfamiliar with the Moche. The Moche were a state level society of some sort or another uh, that was on the north coast of Peru sometime between AD 200 and 750. And uh, they were found it specifically along the coastal valleys between the Pura Valley in the north down to the Warme Valley in the south, or at least their cultural influence is found uh, spread throughout the region during this time period. Um, just to give you some understanding of the, the role that the environment plays on the story I'm about to tell you from my research, I think it's kind of important to set the stage and talk about the nature of the environment as well as um, how the environment also allows us to be able to say some of the, the, the things we can say about the remains that have been recovered of, of the moche. So, Along the, the west coast of South America, the Andes region, uh, it actually is one of the driest desert regions in the world. And this has to do in part because of the Humboldt Current, which uh, runs counterclockwise up the west coast of South America and causes uh, weather systems to dump their rain out at sea. Um, and then as the, the weather systems move from the west to the east, they do accumulate more uh, water, but that that precipitation doesn't come down along the coast. Instead, it comes down in the highlands, uh, totally bypassing the coast. And so what we see along the coast are these very, very dry conditions uh, where the, the river valleys are um, the only place where you find any vegetation. It's, it's complete desolate desert between uh, the coastal valleys. Um, and the only reason why you see any greenery there whatsoever is because people have, have irrigated their, their gardens and agricultural fields. Along the coast itself, in, in the northern region of Peru, there is what we'd refer to as a coastal belt. This is a relatively flat area where the moche um, actually emerged around AD 200 and where we find evidence of their settlements and, and their very large, massive mud brick pyramids that I'll talk about. One of the other interesting things about the region that the Moche inhabited was that in terms of uh, irrigable land and agricultural productivity, uh, it is very high in the north where we also tend to have more precipitation in the highlands. Uh, there's more rainfall, the, the rivers run year round, and, and there's just generally more river discharge uh, per minute. And then as you move farther south in, in the Moche region, there is less and less arrogable land present. And this too may have played a very important role in terms of the Moche uh, and their expansion and collapse, as I'll talk about. So the Moche uh, are 
part of, or at least were found during what we'd refer to as the early intermediate period, a period uh, between around AD 200 and AD, well, it's listed as AD 500, but we now know it actually extends a bit beyond that. Um, and the Moche were uh, a class-based society, and we know this uh, not just because of their lifelike uh, depictions of people of different class and status in their ceramics, but also from their habitations, their, their houses. There are uh, large, large areas that consist of cane structures, and then you have sort of a middle class uh, where the, the housing structures are made of mud brick, uh, but they're not quite as fancy as the, the habitations that are found associated with the mud brick pyramids. We know, uh, or at least we infer, that they were based upon tribute, as were many complex societies uh, in Peru, where uh, people had to pay part of their labor in the form of tribute to the ruling class. And we have many depictions of people making tribute to the leaders of Moche in the forms of things like shells and textiles and ceramics and agricultural products. As I had mentioned, uh, each of the valleys in the Moche region on the north coast of Peru during this time period are dotted by these massive mud brick pyramids. And these mud brick pyramids, or wakas as we also call them, consist of segmented construction. And we believe that this construction was the result of labor tax that was extracted from the inhabitants of each region, each valley, uh, where people would have to, from each community, contribute a certain amount of bricks and perhaps even stack those bricks themselves uh, to contribute to these public works, uh, these mud brick pyramids. And we think this in part because of the segmented nature of the pyramids, but then also within each segment, what we see are that the bricks have uh, distinct uh, markings on them. This is a very similar accounting system that modern Andean peoples use when they're constructing things like community walls or churches or municipal buildings uh, because many of the people are not literate. They do take account, however, still of, of their each families and each community's contribution to these public works. And more than a hundred uh, different symbols have been identified just at the, the one pyramid that I had shown you a couple of images ago. These pyramids would have been decorated by very colorful uh, mud friezes, uh, the mud laying on top of the, the bricks and then painted using natural pigments, quite often depicting uh, scenes of warrior combat as well as sacrifice. The moche were also known for their expert metallurgy and ceramics, very lifelike ceramics that depicted things uh, like the foods that they ate, that's a warty gourd and an ear of corn, uh, lizards, many of the animals that were important to them, daily activities such as uh, smelters making metal objects, women giving birth, women producing uh, chicha or a, a, a I guess a non, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I never remember that word. It doesn't have any bubbles in it, but it's, it's a beer. Anyways, um, so one of the very first uh, scholars to have studied the moche was Rafael Larco. And he amassed a collection of about 100,000 moche ceramics and pre-moche ceramics and established the first attempt uh, at a moche ceramic sequence. And what he suggested was that the moche emerged from uh, the earlier Guyanaso peoples, kind of a, a, a peoples that were also found in the same region where the moche were. But they emerged in the moche valley, and then subsequently through military conquest, he argued, conquered the rest of the region. This model uh, has been challenged, and some of the research of, of some of my colleagues, such, such as Asumi Shimada, Luis Jaime Castillo and Christopher Donnan, who all have their own competing ideas, um, they've arrived at very similar conclusions about the, the emergence of the moche. And what we now have come to understand through intensive investigations over the past four decades is that the moche did indeed emerge in some valleys from the pre-existing Guyanaso people. And so here you see uh, late Guyanaso ceramics uh, from some of the, some of the valleys and just for comparison's sake, some very early moche ceramics. 
and they've revised uh, Larco's ceramic sequence. Largely it stayed intact, but we also now recognize that there was some regional variation going on here uh, that Larco didn't recognize back when he came up with his ceramic seriation back in the 1940s. So what we now understand is that the moche did emerge in multiple valleys simultaneously uh, from Guyanasso, and in some valleys the Guyanasso we now know uh, persisted beyond AD 200. Uh, and the moche eventually began to spread from some valleys. So you can kind of think of these as like competing city-states or complex chiefdoms in each valley. And uh, over the course of the moche's existence, almost certainly uh, what we see is alliances forming, alliances breaking down, very complex political relationships that we are trying to get at um, through both archaeological remains as well as through genetic studies. By the end, however, what we know is that the moche, uh, beginning around AD 600, began to collapse. Uh, and they were replaced by another sort of cultural entity we refer to as the Sikhan. Um, in, in any case, the moche did persist in, in this northern region here uh, beyond AD 750 until about AD 900, but only at a at a handful of select sites. Um, what we also now recognize in terms of regional variation is that there was sort of a northern sphere of moche influence as well as a southern sphere of moche influence. And what we believe was going on during the periods of moche three and four is that there was consolidation amongst uh, sort of like confederations of moche city-states or complex chiefdoms so that you had a no man's land between the northern Moche realm of influence and the southern Moche realm of influence. And there are actually differences in terms of the cultural tra trajectories that the Moche in each of these two different regions uh, followed. And so what I'm going to be talking about primarily are, are the Moche in the southern sphere of influence. And uh, if I can just kind of emphasize this, there are cultural distinctions in terms of their ceramics and their iconography in the northern sphere versus the southern sphere. And this is one of the reasons why we make this, this inference. So in the southern sphere, uh, one of the things that we don't see in the northern sphere, in the southern, that we do see in the southern sphere, are these more moche portrait vessels. By portrait vessels, what we mean is these are ves vessels that are basically portraits of, of individuals that we think were indeed actually real individuals. And these individuals are depicted uh, lots of very distinct facial characteristics. Sometimes we see things like scars on the faces. And these individuals are depicted during different stages and different roles uh, at different stages of their life. And so this is one in particular that my colleague Christopher Donnan has focused on. Uh, somebody he refers to as Bigote because of his mustache and, and funky tuft of hair on the, on the top of his head. And he is depicted as a, an elite individual um, in part because of the very fancy ear rings that he has. Um, this is something we know from our studies of Andean peoples that ear spools and ear rings were associated with very high status. But also he's, his high status is denoted by the staff or the mace that he's carrying something also that we see associated with elite individuals in the ethno-historic and historic record uh, in, in the Andes. But then he's also depicted as a naked bound prisoner with his hands tied behind his back. And there are other individuals who are depicted in the same fashion. So this is Narigon or Big Nose who's also depicted uh, as a relatively elite individual in some portraits but in others as a, as a naked bound prisoner um, and yeah, you can see there even holding his neck, uh, obviously not a very pleasant position to be in. Moche portraits also often depict things like combat between uh, what appear to be moche, prisoner capture, their torture with uh, the, the face flayed. I always like pointing that out and I'll bring that up again in a few minutes. And sacrifice, beheading and sacrifice, very common themes we see in these portraits. The Moche in the south also developed uh, a whole repertoire of fine line vessels. 
uh, during Moche III, beginning around AD 300. Um, and most of these fine line vessels depict things like combat. So this is, just to give you some sense of the way that these look, this is a Moche fine line vessel. And uh, my colleague Christopher Donnan, as well as uh, the late uh, Donna McClelland painstakingly documented more than 40,000 of these fine line vessels, drawing out the images that are found on these vessels so that you can roll them out and actually see what's going on. And so here we see one of these melees or all out uh, combats between what appear to be um, Moche warriors going at it with one another. The Moche uh, fine line vessels also depict, much as the portraits did, uh, uh, capture of prisoners. They're being paraded around, naked and bound. They're apparent uh, being put on trial. Here you can see actually the, the bundles of these two naked bound prisoners, the, the shields, their maces, their helmets, their dart throwers. Their subsequent torture. and Subsequently, they're being led in processions to be sacrificed. So what you see going on back here is a prisoner who has his hands tied behind his back. His head is being drawn back. Uh, and this, this attendant here has a, a, a cup in his hand. This one has a tumi or a sacrificial knife. And he's about to slit the throat of this individual. And what we interpret this to be here is that one of these uh, Priests, bird-like priests, is presenting a cup of blood to this individual um, depicted on this Moche throne. There's one particular ceramic that was first called the sacrifice ceremony, but we now recognize that this the same uh, imagery is repeated time and time again in fine line ceramics of the southern Moche. And so we now refer to this as the presentation theme. It's a recurring theme. And in this particular vessel, what we see is an individual referred to as the radiant being because of this headdress that he has that kind of appears to radiate off the back of him, who's being presented a, a cup of blood by a bird priest. There's another attendant with a cup of blood in her hand, uh, referred to as the priestess. And then there's also a feline priest. In the foreground, what we see is the litter of the radiant being. Christopher Donnan, when he first identified and, and discussed this particular ceramic, also was, was insightful enough to suggest that this represented the staff of the radiant being. And then in front of this litter, what we see are uh, the captured warriors' bundles, along with the captured warriors who are having their throats slit and their blood is being gathered in these, in these cups by these attendants. So back in, in 1987, uh, Walter Alva was called in, a Peruvian Moche archaeologist was called in because of looting activity that was occurring at the Moche site of Sipan. This is the way the site looks today, um, but here's an artist's reconstruction of the way that this site would have looked uh, at the time of its use. And it was in this particular uh, platform here where one of the wealthiest, indeed the wealthiest tomb discovered in the New World was was found because of this looting activity. And Walter Alva came in and uh, actually did a very thorough scientific excavation of this individual who we now refer to as the Lord of Sipan. And what was remarkable about this individual that Walter Alva reported on was that uh, all of the gold and, and silver and bead objects corresponded almost exactly with the things we see depicted uh, by this radiant being. The, the headdress, the nose rings, the bracelets, the, the collar, uh, the back flaps, as well as the staff. He was buried with a staff that all correspond with this imagery that we see in the presentation theme. He too is depicted time and time again in these portrait vessels as a sacrificer, uh, cutting off the heads of, of victims. And so subsequently to uh, 1987, Moche archaeologists have now uncovered individuals who, at the very least, played the roles of these beings or entities depicted in the presentation theme. The priestess, 
uh, the, the bird priest, the feline priest, as well as um, additional pr uh, female uh, attendants have all been discovered um, at Moche pyramid sites. So just an artist depiction of the way these individuals might have looked once they were you know, back in the past. So in the South, we also have very strong evidence that there was an alliance amongst some of the sites found in the southern Moche uh, valleys. In particular, in the Chicama Valley, we have a site by the, not, by the name of Cal Viejo. Uh, and it exhibits some characteristics that are somewhat unique to the Moche sites in the southern sphere of influence. So one of the things that is characteristic of these sites in the south is that they are a bit closer to the coast. They're characterized by dual pyramids. We think that these may represent uh, Andean's worldview of duality, where kind of like a yin and yang, uh, male, female, binary opposition. So you have these two pyramids, one that was called Huaca Cortada, the other Huaca El Brujo. And uh, between these two pyramids, you have this very large and unfortunately very heavily looted residential sector and cemetery. Um, at Huaca El Brujo, um, there have been excavations uh, that have been ongoing now for the past 15 years. And what you're looking at here, uh, I was taking the picture of this from the back side. This is the front side looking towards where I was taking the picture. Uh, they've uncovered a very large plaza out in front of this particular pyramid. And this plaza was adorned with mud friezes. These mud friezes depict uh, on an upper panel these celebrating elite individuals who are holding hands. And down below, what you see is a panel of naked bound prisoners who are being led uh, to whatever fate might have awaited them. Um, and just to kind of show you the way that these actually look, uh, this, this is one of the friezes of the nude bound prisoners. These friezes, incidentally, uh, are typically put up by placing little pegs between the mortar, between the mud bricks. There's celebrating elites. Um, these are the pegs that are typically found that hold up the mud that was then subsequently used to fashion these, these friezes. In the case of some of the parading naked bound prisoners, what we find uh, are human bones. Human bones that were cut out relatively close to the time of death uh, from humans. And these are being used to prop up the mud, freeze, uh, mud freezes. My friend and colleague, John Verano, who came and gave a talk about the Moche sacrificial victims last year, he's been conducting excavations at Cal Viejo uh, in search of Moche sacrificial victims. And indeed, he did find about 10 individuals strewn about in the plaza at Cal Viejo, um, individuals that ex uh, exhibited blunt force trauma to the skull, as well as having their limbs pulled from their bodies around the time of death. And how we know that are, is because of things like osteochondritis, where this was actually detached from the body uh, that still had flesh on it. Um, but the more spectacular human sacrifices were uh, identified by a colleague of mine by the name of Steve Bourget at the quote unquote Moche site, or pyramids at Moche site. Um, this site is found within the Moche Valley. And much like what I was just describing for El Brujo, uh, it's characterized by two very large mud brick pyramids with a very large residential sector between those pyramids. So here we see Huaca de la Luna, or Pyramid of the Moon, large urban sector, and the Pyramid of the Sun, or Huaca del Sol, which incidentally is the largest mud brick pyramid uh, in the New World. Um, it was at the Huaca de la Luna where Steve Bourget focused his, his excavations. And one of the reasons why he focused his excavations there were because of his iconographic studies, where the moche are commonly depicting human sacrifice at the base of or in association with mountains or hills. And so he thought, this is probably a good place to start looking for human sacrifices. This particular pyramid, although it doesn't look like very much uh, in this image, is actually composed of multiple plazas, which were associated with very large public open spaces, as well as platforms, 
which were enclosed and uh, were the residences of the, the ruling elite, what we believe to be sort of like their um, religious elite. So just an artist's reconstruction of, of the Pyramid of the Moon or Waka de la Luna. Um, within the past five years, one of the things that they have uncovered that we already understood from Cal Viejo were these mud brick friezes. So this is a more recent discovery at the Moche site. And what we see is exactly the same mud brick friezes, exactly the same site layout, uh, exactly the same styles of ceramics. And so we have very good reason to think that Waka de la Luna, or the Moche site, and Cal Viejo, or El Brujo, represent part of a southern alliance during the Moche three and four periods. Once again, uh, victorious warriors who are parading about these naked bound prisoners. It's also um, at Waka de la Luna where Steve Bourget did indeed uncover sacrificial victims. Um, the, early, or the, the first ones that were found, he, he discovered these back in, in the late 1980s uh, in a plaza that's referred to as Plaza 3A. And he focused his excavations here once again in part because this plaza surrounded um, a stony outcrop and, and the Moche intentionally chose to construct their plaza around this, this stony outcrop. They could have constructed elsewhere, they chose to construct it there and so he thought that's a good place to look for them. These are however, if I can put this into temporal sequence, the more recent ones, uh, the more recent human sacrifices. So just to give you some sense here, um, this is a plan showing where Plaza 3 is constructed around the rocky outcrop and it was out in front of that rocky outcrop where he found approximately 100 human sacrifices that I'll talk about a bit more. Um, subsequently, as archaeologists continued to uncover earlier layers, my colleague John Verano began excavations, excavations at Plaza 3C where we have also uncovered human sacrifices. So in terms of what kinds of ideas archaeologists have been putting out there to explain these Moche sacrificial victims, there are three main or competing models that have been proposed. One is that of ritual combat, and this is the most prevalent model, or at least has been up until the past couple of years, um, which I'll explain in a bit more detail in a few seconds here. Uh, but another competing model which um, would I guess you could say date back to Rafael Larco would be that of territorial expansion. These human sacrifices rather than combatants in a ritual kind of battle where the, the loser would then be sacrificed actually represent prisoners of war that were captured as the Moche began to expand. Another model is a warfare model amongst competing Moche polities. Um, that being where you've got what culturally appear to us to be the same folks doing battle with one another, uh, somewhat analogous to what we think may have been going on in certain places during certain times in the Maya region in Central America. So the Tinku model is largely based upon these representations of Moche, what appear to be Moche, doing battle one-on-one -on -one with other Moche. And ethnographically or ethno-historically, what we know is that there are still these ritual uh, ritual battles referred to as tinkus in the Andes where you get communities in the highlands that will square off with one another adjacent communities and what they will do is they will go to battle with one another prior to the planting season in hopes of spilling some blood to Pachamama or Mother Earth uh, to ensure the fertility of their crops um, and there's all kinds of other things associated with this but I, I won't go into that um, <laughs> But in, in any case, in other regions of the Andes, uh, this, in, in larger communities, this um, tinku plays out instead as individuals of the same size, of the same sex, and of roughly the same age squaring off in the town square and beating one another into a pulp. Um, and it's never really a good party until somebody's blood gets spilled or somebody dies. Now, in the case of these tinkus, uh, the person who has unfortuitously, you know, from the perspective of the family, given up their life to ensure the crops and ensure the, the livelihood of the community 
is accorded a formal burial. It's a very solemn event, but the person is uh, treated with respect, and indeed the community will often, uh, other members of the community will often pay tribute to that individual who's kind of, who's kind of uh, foregone their life for their benefit. So according to this particular model, um, that is, has been developed by many Moche archaeologists, if indeed this is the case, um, then what we would expect to see in terms of their iconographic depictions is that the battles would be between Moche individuals. According to uh, the modern ethnographic analogy, given how people who do die in Tinkus are treated, we would predict that they'd be treated, in terms of mortuary theory, by being provided with a proper burial. And given that this model stipulates that these individuals are being drawn from the same community where they're being done in, you would expect them to be genetically similar to the rest of the local population. Another model that Rafael Larco, as well as more recently David Wilson uh, and George Lau have proposed is that of Moche on foreigner territorial expansion type combat and uh, George Lau has actually been able to demonstrate that these individuals depicted here that the Moche are kind of beaten up on in the Moche ceramics um, have or are wearing the same sorts of things that people from the Highlands wore a group of people called the Rekwai who were contemporaneous with the Moche and so these scholars have have argued that the Moche sacrificial victims likely represent Highlanders or other non-local peoples who were captured during combat uh, and then you know, treated like many people do treat prisoners by torturing them and sacrificing them. And so in accordance with this model, you would expect the depictions to be predominated by non-local foreigners, battles of Moche on non-local foreigners. If you're Disposing of uh, somebody who's your enemy, you don't expect that person to be afforded the same sorts of treatment and death that you would treat one of your own loved ones. And so we would predict a, a lack of a proper burial. And the differences genetically we might expect to be dramatically different or significantly different from the local populations. Another model that myself uh, and John Verano uh, as well as Jeffrey Quilter proposed, is that of a sort of a feudal model where you've got competing moche polities that are doing battle with one another, um, and maybe even Guyanasso, who we think also appeared culturally to look like moche anyways, uh, in terms of their cultural styles of dress and so on and so forth. Um, We've suggested that this may indeed be a case of Moche doing battle with other Moche and capturing enemy warriors from the competing polity and then bringing them back home and sacrificing them. So if this is indeed the case, what we would expect in terms of the iconographic appearance is a predominance of depictions of Moche on Moche combat. In terms of mortuary treatment, given that they're still enemies, you're not going to treat them or afford them a proper burial. And although uh, they may not be genetically or biologically significantly different, they should certainly be distinguishable from the local population. So in terms of what the actual evidence indicates, um, when we look at the treatment of the Moche sacrificial victims, uh, the very earliest ones, beginning back as early as AD 300, during the beginning of Moche III, when we start first seeing this very bellicose, warlike iconography, um, we actually find these floor burials in Plaza 3C. Uh, in any case, John Verano um, excavated these back in 2000 and 2001. Uh, all of these individuals were buried in floors. In, the, in, in subsequent uh, constructions, they, what the Moche would do is they'd lay down another uh, layer of maybe 10 bricks or so, and before they did that, they'd end up sacrificing people and burying them in these floors. Um, and I'll talk about their treatment in a few minutes. Out in front of uh, the, the rocky outcrop, the more recent sacrifices in Plaza 3A, located here, uh, all of the sacrificial victims were found in this particular area. And as I had mentioned, there were 
approximately 100 individuals. And these individuals represent at least eight distinct sacrificial events, some which occurred during torrential downpours, a point I'll get to here in a few minutes, others uh, during periods when there weren't torrential downpours. And I'll mention how we actually know that. So these remains were strewn all over the plaza floor the, um, and quite often embedded in mud. The forensic analyses of these individuals indicate that without exception, they were all healthy adult males uh, ranging in age between 16 and 35 years of age, with their average age being 23. This is kind of prime young adult male age. And uh, what we know from other analyses is that they exhibit the same sorts of fracture patterns quite often in the process of healing that are character characteristic of interpersonal combat. So something that we refer to as a peri fracture, which is found at the end of uh, the ulna as you're trying to block somebody from hitting you. Very common fracture that we see amongst the Moche sacrificial victims, uh, but so too are healed fractures of, of the skull. All of these things have led John Verano and myself to argue that these were a professional set of warriors. These weren't just typical folks from the local community who were just squaring off you know, for a festival every year um, prior to the planning season. In terms of how they were treated around the time of death, Without exception, they were tortured. We have evidence of their noses being broken, uh, tongues being cut out, and jaws bashed in. Uh, they're being dismembered. And we actually have really great evidence of this. Uh, the bodies are strewn all over the place. Uh, and while certainly one could suggest, well, maybe vultures got in there and dragged some of the bones, um, they don't drag off entire limbs. Uh, further, for some of them, we still have the cordage uh, around the ankles and the wrists. Um, this one I, I like. There were cut marks around the face, almost in exact accordance with these moche portraits that are depicting the face being flayed. Here's yet another, still has a blindfold on, uh, as well as his hair. In terms of the manner of death, uh, most of them for which we could identify the cervical vertebrae, the neck vertebrae, they showed cut marks, multiple cut marks of, across the front of those vertebrae, cutting through the carotid artery and the jugular vein. Lots and lots of blood. Wonderfully gory stuff. Um, also, uh, many of them had their heads bashed in. In terms of how they were treated in death, uh, as I had mentioned in Plaza 3C, these individuals were buried in the floor. Um, not necessarily uh, a very respectful burial, and certainly they didn't have any burial goods associated with them. They were often just crammed into the floor, into pockets that were dug into the floor. And this is one of my favorites. Uh, they just took the guy's head and feet and stuck them into a hole. Yeah, lovely. Uh, all of these individuals showed signs of having been dismembered, defleshed. Um, not cut marks necessarily between the ligaments, between the bones, uh, but all of the flesh removed. And John Verano has suggested that perhaps what they were doing was using sort of these attached skeletons as like trophies or mannequins that they were putting on display before they actually deposited them. At Plaza 3A, uh, what we have, as I had mentioned, are at least eight distinct sacrificial events, some of which are associated with um, the individuals just being laid out uh, and sunbaked with no formal burial. Um, they're not buried with textiles, like the textiles would preserve if they did indeed, if they were clothed. Um, and in, in the case of these burials, they have muscoid, muscoid fly pupa, which lay their eggs in dead and rotting flesh in their internal thoracic cavities. They were just left out to rot. Some of them were also uh, killed during torrential downpours. And we know this because um, they're encased in mud that was coming from the mud brick pyramids, the walls of the mud brick pyramids. And um, 
this only occurs during torrential downpours during El Nino years. Typically, there's absolutely no rainfall all along the coast where the moche existed. And in the case of uh, Plaza 3A, uh, while we don't necessarily have the cordage, we have the impressions of the cordage. The preservation is so good. Um, this is just kind of illustrating El Nino and what happens when this warm body of water kind of migrates kind of like a bathtub uh, across the Pacific towards the western coast of South America and causes all kinds of havoc along the coast. Um, these are recorded in these high resolution ice cores that we have from glaciers in the Andes. Uh, and what we see is that the sacrificial events at Plaza 3A correspond almost exactly with El Ninos, massive El Ninos that were occurring at exactly the same time that these sacrificial events were occurring. So in terms of assessing who these sacrificial victims were, my own research has looked at these genetically influenced or epigenetic traits of the teeth. Uh, the tooth root number and cusps um, are highly heritable characteristics. They've been used to tease out relationships amongst known peoples, known groups of peoples, uh, with and, and actually quite often outperforming actual molecular data, uh, which still surprises both those who do molecular research and those who do my kind of research. Um, and what I looked at were a, a number of different mortuary or skeletal populations, both local populations from the Moche Valley itself, including Guyanaso samples that were contemporaneous with the Moche who existed at the Moche site, as well as other non-local moche from the northern moche region. And when I examine the biological distance or the genetic distance amongst these folks, what we pretty clearly see is that the individuals here are all local individuals. And the moche sacrificial victims stick out like a sore thumb. These were clearly not local people. My examination of the levels of variability within each sample also indicated that the moche sacrificial victims were by far the most variable sample I was looking at. And what that suggests to me is that these moche sacrificial victims were being drawn from different locations from probably the north coast region and perhaps even some from the adjacent highlands or Sierra region. More, more recently uh, a friend and colleague of mine, uh, oh, and I'm sorry, I'm getting this out of sequence, but I, I tested these different models that I was discussing previously, the, the Tinku or the ritual battle model uh, versus a, a non-local warrior model um, against uh, hypothetical matrices, what we would expect in terms of their genetic differences from the local population. And what we see pretty clearly is that uh, the, the ritual battle model simply does not accord well with the genetic relatedness data that uh, I've derived from the moche. Um, a colleague of mine by the name of Marla Toyne has recently analyzed, not yet published, but recently analyzed the strontium and oxygen isotopes from the teeth and the bones. And this allows you to kind of tease out where a person was raised in terms of their diet. And what she's found is that the moche sacrificial victims, not a single one of them was from the local population, which I'm always glad to hear because that kind of confirms what I've been saying for years about the moche sacrificial victims. So very clearly, the moche sacrificial victims were not drawn from the local population and likely represent professional warriors what I would suggest is drawn from competing North Coast polities. And so when we look at these models that I was teasing out, it is the warfare in terms of what we see iconographically. The vast majority of the moche ceramics depict moche on moche combat. They're not being treated or afforded a proper burial. And the differences, although they're not significant, very clearly the moche sacrificial victims stand out from the local populations. So we also know that ethno-historically, uh, their treatment, the treatment of the moche sacrificial victims, is almost in perfect accordance with the way that the ethno-historically documented Inca treated warrior prisoners that they captured. They had a standing army. Uh, they used what we refer to as shock weaponry. Uh, 
close-up shock weaponry, things like maces and hatchets and things of that sort. They would put their prisoners on trial uh, after um, parading them around naked in the plaza at Cusco before doing them in, much as we see there, and would often torture them before doing them in. And then uh, quite often what we know from the early chroniclers is that these uh, these captured prisoners of war would be left unburied under punishment of death. If anybody was caught taking them back to their homeland or burying them, the Inca would put those folks to death as well. This too accords very well with what we see in terms of the treatment of the Moche sacrificial victims and some, some of the other things like you know beheading them and treating their skulls as drinking vessels. We also have evidence of that amongst the Moche sacrificial victims. Anyways, yeah. Okay, so in terms of discussions and conclusions, um, what we understand both archaeologically as well as from my own research is that in the southern Moche sphere there very clearly was an alliance amongst the Moche in the Chicama and Moche valleys and that the prisoners that we see being depicted time and time again in the Moche uh, iconography almost certainly do represent uh, Moche perhaps from valleys to the south as well as valleys to the north who they had captured and brought back to their capital site and then killed and, and not, didn't give them a, a, a proper burial. What we also know however is that the expansion of the southern Moche into some of the valleys to the south, uh, the Viru Valley all the way down to, whoops, I'm sorry, uh, down into uh, places like Huancaco and Huaca del Cruz, this um, corresponds with a period of environmental stress that the Moche were undergoing. And if you remember, I was pointing out that these valleys in the southern sphere are under much tighter environmental uh, restrictions because of this lack of rainfall that comes down through the valleys. So what we see during the Moche IV period is this extended period of drought in the ice core data that just so happens to correspond to an encroachment of a dune into the Moche site itself. We think that this may well explain as the, as the Moche's agricultural output was declining, they sought to maintain their power in part by conquering, sometimes through military conquest, sometimes through negotiation, valleys to the south. But during the Moche V period, beginning around AD 600, we have evidence that this finally pushed the southern Moche over the edge. Um, during this period, we see the collapse of the Moche in the southern sphere, and this corresponds very closely with these massive El Nino events that they uh, were hit with repeatedly following this extended period of drought, beginning around AD 600. And if you're not at all familiar with what El Nino events do in Peru, in the coast of Peru, they completely silt over the agricultural fields. So they were already having declined agricultural output. And with these El Ninos completely silting over their agricultural fields, it rendered them useless, at least for years uh, during which they'd need to reclaim those fields. What we also see uh, in the southern sphere of Moche influence is that a new site appears inland from the Moche site itself. This is where the Moche site is located. There's another site that shows very strong affiliation with the Moche sphere in the north. We get this style of ceramics that appears and the site is enclosed uh, with the wall facing towards the Moche site and there's piles of sling stones found all over this site as you get this evidence of a moche intrusion from the north. In the northern sphere, what we see during the same period of climatic change is that the moche in the northern sphere move their sites inland closer to the uptakes of water and along this no man's land they actually construct fortifications all along their southern border suggesting that there was indeed conflict with the Moche in the south. Eventually the Moche in the south simply succumbed. They, the people became a different 
set of folks, the Sikan, uh, and we see evidence of an influence of highlanders coming into the valley in the southern Moche region. So what all this research can kind of also help us to do is reinterpret some of the Moche ceramics that in my opinion have been misinterpreted for decades. Things like this which my colleague uh, uh, Christopher Donnan and my, my colleague Steve Bourget have suggested would be analogous to depictions of Christ on the cross, um, sort of honorable depictions of people. I would suggest instead these were probably being used as forms of propaganda showing what happens to those who might try to resist the Moche's attempts at conquering them. Uh, and in terms of the Moche on Moche depictions of combat, I would suggest that probably these are best interpreted as competing moche, moche from competing complex chiefdoms or polities that were going at it with one another. And these ceramics certainly are depicting combat, one-on-one -on -one combat, but that this one-on-one -on -one combat was not ritual. It was all very, very real. Um, we see very similar kinds of iconographic depictions in places like Central America amongst the Maya, where this is a very highly encoded form of communication where you have symbolically one leader taking over the leader of another Mayan capital site. So I would suggest that all of this iconography is just very laden with symbolism that uh, unfortunately I think has been overinterpreted by many of the iconographers, many of the Moche iconographers. Scenes like this certainly don't speak to me uh, of individuals who simply lost a, a, a weekend battle prior to the planning season. This is an entire set of warriors who've been captured and who are being led to their final fate. And in terms of what we can make of something like uh, the presentation or sacrifice theme, one of the early indigenous chroniclers by the name of Waman Poma de Ayala explains to us that warriors would often take on the names or the, the characteristics of winds and creatures, birds of prey, uh, crabs, and things of that sort that are perceived of as being very fierce powers in nature and would dress up in, the, in that style. Uh, so what many of us are now suggesting is that these individuals depicted in the sacrifice theme uh, represent warriors who took on, um, took on the persona of things from nature and that those were probably passed on from generation to generation amongst their sons. So I guess at the end of the day we can all say we can be glad we're not Moche sacrificial victims. Anyways, that's it. I didn't leave a whole lot of time for questions, but if anybody has any questions, yeah, Bruce. I was uh, kind of watching that gap in the in the range that showed up periodically, and it wasn't until, if you know what I mean, where you had the north yes, and the, the south. Uh -huh. And I'm wondering uh, if it were if it was a no man's land or if it was just a, a, a bad area to be. At, but then you at the end you were talking about fortifications and that sort of thing. So what what was going on in in that gap? It is a it is a large expanse. Um, it's a relatively flat. Pampa area um, that extends between irrigated valleys that currently you can irrigate and occupy. I mean, people uh, in that region, they during the during the Moche's um, existence, they actually reclaimed a lot more agricultural land than what's currently in use today. So it's not that they couldn't have occupied that area, and they, they even have. Um, between the Chicama Valley and the Moche Valley, the Moche constructed this, this canal that carried water from one valley to the next. So they were, they were actually very expert in terms of their hydrology. So it wasn't a matter of not being able to reclaim that land if they chose to. And subsequent to the Moche's collapse, we actually do have um, subsequent Sikan and Moche occupation of that area. So this was an area that had absolutely no Moche occupation and we do see these very clear cultural distinctions on either side of that no man's land that does suggest this was 
recognized as like a demilitarized zone of some sort. Yeah, Louise. Um, it seemed like all of the ceramics had a circular extension on them and a handle on top of that. Steer what spout was, vessels, yeah. Yeah, what was the significance or purpose of that? Um, some of the stirrup spout vessels actually have whistles built into them. Not necessarily the ones I showed here, but this is a style that um, actually emerged, oh goodness, uh, about a thousand years earlier amongst the Chavine people. And the exact significance we don't know, but it is kind of easy to carry them around. Um, there have been hypotheses about that stirrup spout vessel form perhaps uh, preventing the liquids from evaporating off because it is very dry in the region. So this too may have had something to do with the vessel form itself. So these were functional vessels? Oh yes, yes, these were functional vessels. Some of them that I didn't have the time to talk about, I used to get to talk about them when I had less to say, uh, they actually have remnants of chicha, dregs of chicha beer in them. Others have dregs of human blood in them. Yeah. Positively confirmed. Yeah, Kip. Just a quick question. I was curious about the availability of wood in this area and if that um, factors into, I mean, obviously there are nice symbolic reasons that human skeletal material were used to kind of anchor architectural sculpture, mm -hmm. but would it have been kind of a necessity to some point of view just because there wouldn't have been wood available because it was so dry? I don't think so, in part because the tombs that they were building uh, have these really big massive trunks and planks holding them up. I mean, there, there are large trees still being used, very large trees. and. Um, certainly you might be familiar with this, as, as people begin to exhaust wood in their environment, what you start to see is a decrease in terms of the diameter of the wood available. And given the kinds of wood that was still being used in the tomb construction of the elites, even towards the end of the moche, we know that there were still very old trees that were being, being cut down. Yeah, Mark. <coughs> tribes that could address the first hypothesis so whether or not they're coming from the highlands that is a question and the problem is that there are skeletal remains that are at some of the museums in Peru but they're not well provenienced so we know they kind of come from that valley but we don't know the time period that they come from and so all the samples that I've used have very good chronological control on them. Um, now, the research that's being done by Marla Toyne, uh, the one who's looking at the stable isotope analysis, um, even though she hasn't officially reported this, she might be when she comes here uh, in February to give a talk um, at the Midwest Andean conference that I'm hosting, plugging my conference. Uh, she, she has told me that it appears as though some of them are coming from the highlands. And you can distinguish that in part because of the oxygen-18 isotopes indicating the, the altitude that, the, that they were coming from. Well, thank you all very much for coming.